Hello, I am Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. And today, instead of the two back or not to back, we are actually doing a totally different video about campaign games and way too many campaign games and stuff like that. So basically, short version is usually Monday's video is to back or not to back the Kickstarter coverage of the week. But this week, we are lucky enough to give our wallets a tiny little bit of a break. And this week, there are basically not many big campaigns. So we did one last week, we'll do one next week. And this week, we're covering this instead. And specifically, I'm covering 24 campaign games, 24 epic degrees of content and campaign and just way too much stuff that I, I ultimately will have to make some hard decisions around. Now, I already did a video on the general subject a while ago called uh, The Problem with Gloomhaven and Other Campaign Games or something like that. And this is the same idea. Although, to give more clarity, because I always get the occasional comment in that video of, well, those don't get those games then. This is not about complaining about anything. This is very much first world problems. This is very much the idea, the process of many games intrigue me, many games interest me. But campaign games have a different barrier, a different threshold of whether I can reasonably justify keeping them in the collection because they are taking up a lot more time. I can get a game like Inish to the table three, four times a year and call it a day, but can you really get a game like Gloomhaven to the table three, four times a year? Does that justify owning it? Is that even the way it's meant to be played? And so campaign games by their very nature demand or ask more of our time, and that means that they need to be a, a higher level to justify keeping them. Now, I went through both the games that I own as well as the games I have coming in, and I came to 24 campaign games. And starting us off, we're going to be talking about USS Freedom. And these first five, and I'm going to be ranking these or talking about these, not ranking. I'm going to be talking about these in the order that I think they are most likely to leave the collection. The ones that I think are slowly leaving versus the ones I think are more likely to, to outlast the other games. And some of these I've played, some of these I have not. All of them in some way I either own or have backed. And so USS Freedom, and more specifically these first five, fall into a bit of a different category because they are games that almost inherently, at least the way I view them, they aren't meant to be kept forever. Some games, some campaign games, are games that I will happily play again and again and again as I go through them. They require multiple sessions in a row, but you can keep replaying them. Other campaign games I want to go through once and call it a day and move on to the next experience. Some TV shows, some movies, some books, you will constantly re-explore, re-come back to, to, to journey through that again. And others you read once, watch once, listen to once, and move on from. Although, listen to once, I guess music is, it's rare that you listen to a song only once. I digress. So, USS Freedom is going to be a game by Dreamcraft Games. I had the opportunity to play this one. This is one that I played the prototype. And this is one where it is offering a, like, I think if I recall correctly, it's 36 missions is going to be the campaign. And if you lose early, you can die and reset. But if you succeed, you'll be going through 36 missions. And I imagine I will give... It's somewhere in that range. If I play it once and die four missions in, I will probably restart and continue, or restart and whatever. If I play it once and die 27 missions in, I'm probably done with the game. It's a game that I'm probably ready to move on from, because while I enjoyed this game, while I am looking forward to this game, while I, with the, the, the puzzle of trying to manage your resources, of manage how to fight in a space exploration or ground exploration battle as you go through different scenario after scenario with your characters and their abilities and all of that, it was a lot of fun. But also at the same time, it's not, there didn't seem to be enough variability in what I was playing and what I was experiencing that I don't think I am likely to go through this 40, 50, 60 times. I think 36 missions is likely enough for me. Now, again, this is all a judgment call. Could well be I'll love it. Could well be I'll think this is the best game ever and that it will continue to grow and develop as I played it. I did enjoy the puzzle, to be very clear. It's not that this isn't the game that I enjoyed. It's that these first five are all games that I think I might enjoy in a limited batch and then be ready to move on to the next one. And speaking of the next one, we have Tainted Grail. And this is going to be one of three games from Awakened Realms all in a row. And I'm realizing I should really just stay away from Awakened Realms. And Awakened Realms is going to be Tainted Grail. And Tainted Grail is a game that I have not played yet, which is why this is the lowest of the three, because I don't even know if I'll enjoy it. I've heard a lot of good things about the game. I've heard some mediocre things, some words of warning, some words of encouragement. There are many different opinions around this game, but ultimately you cannot escape the fact that it's rated like an 8.6 or something like that on Board Game Geek. That is nothing to sneeze at. Bringing you hundreds of hours of content in a in a gameplay experience with both story and narrative driven as well as and mechanically driven, it is one that I am looking forward to finally breaking it out and bringing it to the table, but I don't yet know whether it's something that I'll play two missions and be like, you know what, it's not good enough for me. Or alternatively, play, you know, an entire campaign and think that it's excellent, it's great, it has promise and potential, 
but do I really need to go through all three boxes? Because I went all in on this, and I went all in on this wave to a mistake that I constantly bring up and a mistake that I will not repeat. Never back Awaken Realms games with two-wave shipping. You will, you will be waiting a long time for your game. Although there's an argument to be made that you could, so that you can then see what the reviews are like, so that you can then decide what you want to add to wave two, whatever. Either way, I mean, it's not whatever, it's a good point. But... Awakened Realms or Tainted Grail is one that I'm looking forward to, but I'm not yet sure. But again, even if I like it, even if I love it, I'll go through it once and move on from it almost certainly. Which means just the Etherfields. Etherfields is going to be the next one. And this one I have had the opportunity of playing. I have had the opportunity of playing Etherfields. And I do enjoy this game. I have it set up on my table still, under my table still. It's one that I, I, I played it a whole bunch. I went through multiple Dream After Dream in order to do both the review and a comparison to ISS Vanguard when I was covering that. And then since then, I think I played it once, maybe twice since then. It's one that I have not gone back to, not because of a lack of love for the game, but rather because so many other games, and this is one that requires me not to just sit down and play a single session, but rather it's asking me to sit down and play multiple sessions, because either Fields is one that I think, I could be wrong here, I think I plan on finishing the core box and then not coming back for more. While I like the game, while I like either fields, the story doesn't pull me in so much as the the weird hauntingness of different experiences all wrapped around a single engine. It is a single engine with single singular rules that are in place that drive forward everything. And yet they've managed to craft every dream in a way that it feels different while feeling the same at the same time. But the story aspect, the narrative aspect, does not have me pulled in. And mechanically speaking... I don't consider it as good as many other games. And so it falls into this middle zone of an experience that I enjoy, an experience I plan on finishing the core game to go through that whole thing, but I don't know if I feel strongly enough about it to continue going through the next Wave 2 content, whatever else is out there, not given itself. Again, it's on its own merits, I would. But in comparison to other games that are asking me to play them, it's just a constant struggle. And so either feels, I think, is also going to go away. Now, ISIS Vanguard. ISIS Vanguard is going to be my favorite of, well, I said, I was about to say favorite of the three, but I haven't played Tainted Grail. ISIS Vanguard is going to be my favorite of the two, for however much of that counts. But ISIS Vanguard is one that I thoroughly enjoyed, and this more so than the rest, I think I really will go through all of the content. I enjoyed it so much, and it also has a degree of replayability that, while I don't think I will replay anything, I think I'll just go through the entire campaign and move on from it, it does have a degree of replayability that is amazing. If you watch, something I've talked about before, and I will talk about it again, but if you watch the, 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 the second mission that the Dice Tower played, and then Jesse, Jim Quackalope, and I played as well. So we have the Quackalope, Board Game Co., the Dice Tower, all playing the second mission. And we had two totally different experiences. Not marginally different, not slightly different, two totally different experiences. We landed, that part we shared in common, then we moved off in different directions and experienced totally different experiences on that second planet, on that second mission. That gives you a degree of replayability that cannot, I mean, you can't sell that in words. We were sold that in experiences. We experienced different games in the same mission which is amazing to me. It really is a testament to the fact that each planet can be visited again and again and again. This one I think I'm looking forward to more because these narrative games generally don't pull me in as much mechanically, and so the question is how good are you narratively to make up for the fact that you're not Blood Rage, that you're not Inis, that you're not Cyclades. And Isis Vanguard, more so than any of the others, are, are is one that did pull me in narratively. It really did. It hooked me in the sense that there was true consequence, there was true impact to the things you did. I mean, Jesse, Quackle, he wiped out an entire civilization because he decided to push just a little further, not understanding that it had consequences. And then you'd think he'd learn, but he did the same thing a few minutes later by trying to, like, you know, we're getting a calm back from one of our pilots. Oh, yeah, we're seeing trouble, whatever it is, so what should we do? And he's like, no, push further. And that pilot died. And, and granted, it's a fictional death and not a real death, but there's a degree of consequence, a degree of ownership around killing off your crew slowly but surely. And Isis Vanguard is one that I, I really do like, but I think I will eventually be moving on from it. And now we get to Time of Legends Destinies, or just Destinies. I think the names change, copyright issues, whatever it is. And this is an interesting one, because this is where I talk about the fact that my list is inherently subjective. Not even, like, debatably subjective. It is an inherently subjective list of games that I chose to include and games I chose not to include. And what I mean by that is... I chose to add anything that I view as a campaign experience, regardless of the fact that many of these you could experience as solo play, and many of these, many of the games I left off you could experience as campaign. Massive Darkness 2 is a game I left off this list that does have a campaign mode, but I view it as a solo experience because that's the way I played the first one, and so I'm okay with that. All of these Zombicides are solo experiences as far as I'm concerned. Time of Legends Destinies may well be something that people will argue it as a solo experience, and it may well be I have not played it. 
But in my head, I view it as a campaign experience. And so that's why this list of 24 games is inherently subjective to what I personally view as a campaign experience versus a solo one-shot scenario. To that end, Time of Legends Destinies gives you a an app base. It gives you that Chronicles of Crime gameplay, but in more of an explorative mode, and more of a, a journey, more of a seventh continent combined with Chronicles of Gr- Crime, taking aspects from both and yet aspects of neither and combining it into an experience that I have not played, but I'm looking forward to. I'm curious what this brings and whether it does enough. And, and this one is the first of the games that I believe does fall into more of a replayability kind of category that I think it, I may well replay it multiple times. I don't really know. They they claim it'll be totally different each time. It could be. I, I haven't experienced this one and it doesn't fall into a clear pattern like Awakened Re- Realms games do. And so I don't know whether this is good for one or multiple plays, but to a certain extent, even though it might be good for multiple I, I still think that it could go either way. I may well play through it all and then move on from it. I may well play through a few and then and then keep going through it again and again. I don't really know. Or I may play one game and decide it's not for me. But Time of Legends Destinies has a lot of content and it very much like everything else on this list is is fighting for time and attention in a world where we have limited time and attention. Which brings us to our case. Our case is another one that I don't know if I'm going to be playing again or playing it once and moving on from it. Because this one too, this is going to be buying comma board games with Antoine Bazar, Quentin Lebrat, Ludovic Mablanc, and Theo Rivera attached to this game. And miniatures that are amazing, an immersive campaign, a resettable campaign in, in, in a sense. I don't know how resettable it is. Is this a legacy experience? Because initially it seemed to be, but then they kind of added things you could do to not make a legacy, to make it more campaign rather than legacy. It, I don't know how replayable this is. Keep in mind, I am someone that has replayed Pandemic Legacy Season 1 twice, Pandemic Legacy Season 2 twice. I've gone through both of them two times because if I like a game enough, and especially if it's a game I'm playing with my wife or a game I'm playing solo, a game that I can hit the table more often and isn't taking up from the more frequent, the less frequent game time I have with my game group, then it's a game that I can see myself playing again. So I don't know where this one falls. I don't know whether it's replayable or not. And again, I don't know if I like it. So it's still in this lower tier of, of how do you actually you know see where it goes. And then we'll move on to Gloomhaven. But I'll take a break first. And Gloomhaven. Gloomhaven is one that I'm pretty sure will be leaving my collection before many of these games even arrive. I've talked about this a little bit. It's still on my shelf. I still have a degree of doubt of I must play Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion first. But also, I don't know if I do. Because I like Gloomhaven, I really do. The few times I played it, I thought it was excellent. And yet, I never, ever look at it and think to pull it out because it's in a box the size of three bowling balls. It's huge. This thing is an investment to bring it out. Even if you have an insert, which I certainly do, I have a broken token insert. And yet, the idea of pulling this out to the table, setting everything up, jumping back into where we left off, and playing it often enough that I don't have to constantly reset. And yes, I'm aware of the Gloomhaven Helper app, but you still have to mentally jump back to where you were. This is not a game I can play infrequently. It's not a game I'm willing to play infrequently. And so it's a game I need to be playing on a semi-regular basis, and I just don't feel the drive to do so. It's still here for now, because I keep telling myself that I'll play Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion first and then decide. That I'll go through the full campaign book of Jaws of the Lion. That is an accessible experience. And then I get comments from people saying that when I do so, that's when I'll jump back into Gloomhaven. And so it stays for now. But it's definitely one that constantly gets looked at every single time I'm trying to decide which games will get my time and attention, which games will get played versus which ones will not. And so Gloomhaven for right now is safe, but time will tell as to whether it's safe, you know, in the long run. Moving on from there, we have Divinity Original Sin. This is one that I backed that I am more and more certain will not stay long term. Now, many of the games that I backed here are games that I backed with the understanding that they will hold their value or likely will hold their value to some degree. And so I don't mind jumping into something and letting that FOMO carry me through if I think that I'm not losing money and time and energy along the way. And I like the the high of the campaign. I like being involved. There's a video I have come, coming up about the nature of Kickstarter, the addiction of Kickstarter, where it's fun, where it's hurtful, and how to balance all of that. And so Divinity Original Sin, I certainly plan on playing it, don't get me wrong. When it does show up, it's one that I do plan on playing and seeing what experience it gives me. Because this one, what stood out to me was not the, the IP. I never played Divinity, the video game. But rather, this one looked like it was doing something different. It looked like it was doing something intriguing. It looked like it was doing something that made it stand out from other games in the same category. And that difference is why I decided to jump in. And I love the updates they're giving about the new type of artwork they're providing. Artwork that I find vastly superior to the original artwork that I thought was fine. And this one I think is better. I don't know where it stands long term. I don't know. I have no idea if it's a good enough game to keep. I have no idea if it's too narrative, too mechanical, not enough, either or both. I don't know. And that's why it is lower down this list. 
but it's still one that I plan on trying, and it's still one that I'll see if it is for me or not, with all their deluxified miniatures. I wasn't even that pulled in by the miniatures in this one, honestly. They were okay. They weren't a problem, but it wasn't what drove me in on this one. This is one that I almost didn't back, and then I did in the end, and I, I don't I don't think I regret backing it. I think I'm still happy with the fact that I'm going to get the opportunity to try it and see if it's for me, but I may well move on from it at the end. We will we'll see and find out. From there, we go to Hell the Last Saga. Speaking of games that I shouldn't have backed or that I debated not backing, Hell the Last Saga is very much in that category. Coming from Mythic Games, now Mythic Games does have games that I love, Super Fantasy Brawl I love, but Reichbusters I did not, and, and Hell the Last Saga, the price point for the content they were giving was just too good for me not to jump in, and I know people who have, have experienced this, I know people who have played it online who loved their experience and are looking forward to getting it, and that drives home hope that it will actually be a game for me. And yet, the gameplay didn't pull me in. This is when we are first starting to see Kickstarters around uh, TTS. This is the first time when the world shut down for the first time. And all content creation was drifting over to Tabletop Simulator, but no one was really doing it well. And so I know Quackwolf did a, a video of this game later on in the campaign, but initially at least, all the content creation was being done just over TTS plays with no one, no one guiding them in a way that made them work. And so they looked utterly boring. Like, utterly boring. Like, I'm not trying to mince words at all. If it wasn't for the the, the value proposition, or if it wasn't for the, the, the track record for Mythic Games, if it wasn't for the people I know who played it and enjoyed it, I would not have touched it with a 10-foot pole because those gameplays, they did not pull me in at all. But that said, I tend to think that narrative-based experiences don't make for the best gameplays to begin with. And I think it's worse when you're playing on TTS, and it's worse when you're playing on TTS with people who don't know what they're doing on TTS. And so this is one where I am simultaneously... Really excited for the miniatures, although I won't be keeping it if it's not a game I like. Really uncertain about the game itself. And and for right now, the thing carrying it forward is the fact that, again, it will certainly hold its value. And I have I know people who have played it and enjoyed it, and we'll see where it ultimately fares for me. Moving on from there, we have the Hunter's AD 2114. And this is a game where my ignorance of being able to talk about the game is why it's lower down this list. Because I do not know anything about the game. I did not plan on backing this one. I had a bunch of people in the comments pushing me to back it, saying, no, Alex, it's great, because I covered the campaign. I talked about it as I want to do, and I had a lot of people tell me how good the experience is, and I I was pulled in despite myself. This is a game that I backed 100% because of the comments around the table, and this is one of the few games that I do regret backing, to be clear. Now, it's not that I regret backing it from the stance of it may or may not be the right game, but rather it did seem to be, even the people who loved it did seem to think that the content was overwhelming. It provided you an overwhelming amount of an experience. And for a game that I wasn't personally pulled in by, why did I choose to dive down that rabbit hole of an overwhelming experience? It's not that the game isn't good, it's that I constantly look for reasons not to back things. And this is a game where I didn't have enough reasons to back it, and yet I did instead. Now I still plan on trying it, to be clear. I still plan on seeing whether it's a good game for me. This is one where the Kickstarter was a reprint of an existing game, which means we had data, we had reviews, we had people who loved the game. And so I plan on seeing whether this is a game for me. I don't know. We'll find out. Time will tell. But ultimately, it's one that I'm not excited enough about because I don't know enough about how it plays. And so we'll see where it lands up. And from there we go to Assassin's Creed Brotherhood of Venice. And this is one where I am excited for it. But it's also going up against V Commandos because ultimately this was a rebranding of V Commandos. Differences in the gameplay, to be sure. This is brought to you by Triton Noir and Ubisoft. And this go is going to bring you differences in the gameplay and more of a campaign-driven experience than V Commandos was. Both of them have that aspect of the missions, but this one tied it more into a campaign. And I'm, I'm curious to see how it plays out because I loved Assassin's Creed, the video game. But at the same time, I don't think I was very pulled in by by the transition of the commandos to this. It fits. Everything about it fits, to be clear. But I don't know what it is. Something about it just didn't pull me in. Despite not even being a World War II person, I found myself more intrigued by the World War II game of the commandos. And yet, I'm, I'm excited for this, don't get me wrong. I don't regret backing this. Again, I think it'll hold its value just fine, and I do want to try it out. The reason this one's lower down is because this one's not just fighting against whether it's a good game or not. But unlike the other games, it is fighting against a direct competitor. It is fighting against V Commandos. I can't imagine that I have room for both in my collection. The gameplay similarities are too strong. So I think I'm going to ultimately end up keeping one. And the problem I have now is that V Commandos is launching shortly with more content. So now I have to back, not have to. There's no have to here. Now I'm probably going to end up backing more content for the game I love while still possibly having its replacement on the way. What kind of dysfunctional life do I live? My only, I guess 
reconciliation is that half of you are doing the same dysfunctional stuff. That should not make me feel better, by the way. That should make me feel worse. I'm an enabler, if anything else. But yeah, Assassin's Creed. It's one that I'm excited for, but I don't know. It's going to have to be weighing up against V Commandos. Which brings us to the Ever Rain. This, at this point, I think is my longest, my oldest Kickstarter that I am waiting on. And this is one where I was excited about it. It looked intriguing. It looked interesting. The gameplay, this is coming from Grimlord Games, and I did not keep Village Attacks. I thought Village Attacks was fine, and it's a game that I played like eight or ten times or something, which is definitely a game that's fine. Don't get me wrong. Most games that leave my collection do not hit eight or ten. There are games I love on my shelf that have not hit eight or ten plays. But at the end of the day, Village Attacks was fighting against other games in that genre. A game, like, to me, it felt like Zombicide, and yet I preferred Zombicide. And I know that that comparison will be fought against by some who like both, or like one, or like the other. But ultimately, they were filling the same genre, and I preferred Zombicide, so I just kept Zombicide. But but the Everrain, the Everrain looked different enough. It looked like it was doing something different, a little bit unique. Not that unique. It's still a narrative-based, you know, story-driven game with mechanical aspects, whatever. But it's hitting a lot of the high notes, but the low notes felt different. And the, the theme, the setting set it apart. And yet, it's been two years. And so, like Wild Ascent before it, it's hitting a point where I'm just not as excited as I used to be. Still intrigued. But wondering now whether it'll hold up. Because I backed this when I had time for these games. I backed this when I had four campaign games as opposed to 24 campaign games. And so the Ever Rain is, is on a hit list, as everything else is here. But we'll see when it actually does show up. Keep in mind, Wild Ascent did deliver for me. Moving on, we have Hate, which is actually just out of the camera shop, but it's right above my head over there. So I own this one. I have not played it. And I very much view it as a campaign experience. I believe you can one-shot it, I'm not certain, but it very much is multiple people going through the different skirmish battles, upgrading their tribes, going through more skirmishes. You could theoretically play it with groups or teams of people, going through your own progression of fighting one against the other and cross-fighting, whatever it is, as you go through this kind of skirmish-based campaign experience. And I want to play The Hate. I've heard many good things about the game. Everyone I know who's played it, well, most people I know who's played it, have liked it. But I just have other two-player games that have stopped me from pulling this out. I really should get it to the table. Maybe this is one of those things that I can get, like, I don't know, maybe I'll do Patreon-exclusive gameplay content. I have no clue. We'll figure it out. But ultimately, I need to get this one to the table because it's sitting on my shelf taking up a lot of space. But then again, it has now become the backdrop for my reviews, and I do kind of like it in the background. So I'll have to find a replacement if I get rid of it, which brings its own set of problems. But I I like these types of games. I like these skirmish-style games. I like Rum and Bones. I like... I can't think of anything. I'm blanking on all of them. I like Bloodstone. I like games where you roll dice and attack people as long as I feel there is choice in what you are doing, as long as I feel it is not simply close the gap, hit each other, and call it a day. The games where you simply close the gap, hit each other, and call it a day are the games where I tune out of it. I need something else driving the conversation forward, whether it's objectives, whether it's abilities that that mix up the experience. I just need to feel like I'm constantly making decisions about what, when, how far, and whom. All those things will make a skirmish game better for me. And and hate brings enough characters to the table and other side objectives that I think it will work for me. But I don't actually know. Thematically, I'm not pulled in at all. Thematically, the idea of this gross, over-the-top, gorish world is just not something that pulls me in. But we shall see. From there, we go to Bardsung. A game that I am excited for and also not at the same time. This is a weird one. This is going to be by Steamforge Games. And I had the opportunity to play a boss fight of this game. And to be very clear... The boss fight did not pull me in. It wasn't that I played this boss fight. It was like, that was the best fight ever. Rather, I played the boss fight and it was enjoyable. It was it was solid. It was interesting. But I need more plays to really see where it lies. And for me, the reason I ultimately ended up backing this one is because Steamforge games, for better or for worse, they will hold their value at least initially. This is one that I can get to the table and see if it's for me. And if it's not, I can turn around and get my money back easily as long as I do that before, you know, tons of reviews pour in talking about the game. But it seemed intriguing. It seemed like it had promise. I am intrigued by the idea of the campaign experience that is lightweight and accessible as you level up your heroes, your characters, and whatnot. This is the kind of campaign game that looked like it's the kind of thing that I can play with my wife at the end of a long day, knocking it out, getting through it, and experiencing whatever. I went all in on it, which I do regret that. I think I should have just gone base game on this one. I don't need all the the content, the deluxification, all the... I don't mind having the expansion in it, but having all those terrain extras was completely unnecessary. It's going to add to the reasons why I don't pull this game out as opposed to adding to the reasons why I do pull this game out. That was me being pulled in by miniature porn, and it's something that I need to work on because I don't mind miniatures. I love miniatures, but I do mind miniatures when they prevent the accessibility of gameplay. And so all this terrain or whatnot, if I use, if I don't use it, why'd I pay for it? And if I do use it, well, it's going to add to the, the blockage of actually playing the game. 
But yeah, despite myself, I'm kind of more excited for Bard Song than I thought I would be when I first backed it. I, I literally backed it only because it'll hold this value. And I was like, you know what? Hey, I played it. It's not bad. Let me see where it actually goes. And if I don't like it, I can sell it. But as time goes on, I've grown more excited about it. And it's worth mentioning, by the way, Steamforge Games is doing something that I've barely seen anyone do. They've been adding updates. They've been adding options after the campaign has ended, they've been giving people basically characters. They've been doing all this, like, you know, through the pledge manager. They've been giving, you know, new minis added to all the pledges. So in other words, the campaign is over. The game is completely over. And they didn't even promise this beforehand. It wasn't some tease to get people to do it. They've literally just been adding more miniatures to the game based on how the pledge manager is doing. Or at least I think it's based on how the pledge manager is doing. I could be wrong. Which is nice. I like to see that continuation of the experience. I think it's nice. It continues to drive people in throughout it. And it's... I mean, it's more content for a game that people already paid for, so kudos to Steamforge Games for doing that. Moving on from there, we have Unsettled, a game that I know nothing about, and yet it ranks so highly because it is from the people who made Vindication. It is from Orange Nebula, and I do love Vindication. Vindication is my, my number 10 game of all time. I love it every single time I play it. And so even though I don't know how Unsettled plays, I don't know much about the Unsettled gameplay or the experience or anything like that, at the end of the day, they bought a lot of goodwill by making a game that I enjoyed so much, and so I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued as to what this actually will be like, whether it'll be good, whether it'll be for me or not, but it's it has me interested. I don't know. I mean, that's, that's really... I, I If it sounds like I'm clueless and shouldn't have backed it, then you're right. I am clueless and shouldn't have backed it. But then again, how many other people? We have 10,000 other people shouldn't have backed it either. There was not enough content around this game. This game was presented as a promise, as the, the hints and touches of what the gameplay is like without a clear idea of what you were actually buying into. And so I'm still excited, despite myself, but that would be unsettled. Then we have Trud Bang Legends. Trudvine Legends is another game that I was not actually that excited about when I first backed it. I was intrigued by it, but I actually, this was a, a command Kickstarter I planned on skipping. And there are only a handful that I do skip. Well, technically this wouldn't count as one because I didn't skip it in the end, but there are a handful of command Kickstarters that I skip, and this is one that I thought would be one. The campaign started, and I had no interest. I jumped in for the early bird pledge because just in case, why not? And then as the campaign developed, I, I found myself more and more pulled in. Now, this would actually be higher up. I'm, I'm more excited about the game. I'm more excited about the legend system, about sleeving cards into the board. Let me see if I can find a picture here. The idea of sleeving cards into a board as the campaign develops so you can kind of have a 7th continent feel, but with a save system literally built into how the game works. That idea, you see the little patches over here? You sleeve cards into the board, progressing the story and, and things that evolve or change over time. The idea, the game has a memory. The game has history and story and things that happen. You can progress and you can end up changing the game state down the road as your characters grow, live old, die, whatever it is. And it has this rune system, this bag building system that I enjoyed or appreciated. But ultimately it's one that the, the progression of the campaign and the fact that it kind of seems to have semi-fallen apart behind the scenes and is being reconstructed has me on the fence-ish, I don't really know. And I remember I did a full Should You Back It video, or more specifically, I did a full Why I Backed It video on this game, and and it's one that many of the reasons I did were because there were other people who had enjoyed the game. There were people who, there was one guy who played the game like a hundred times or something ridiculously bizarre and loved it. There was Board Game Coffee, you had the chance to play it at a con, and they enjoyed it, and they, I know that they share, that I mostly share the same taste with them in Come On Games. And so I, I backed it. I'm excited for it but also a little hesitant about all the rewrites and things going on behind the scenes on this game. Which brings us to Madara. Now, Madara is one that should fit the exact same category as Gloomhaven, and I'm not certain why it doesn't. To begin with, the theme is certainly different. I love the anime style here going on, and keep in mind, I am someone who does not typically like anime style things in games at all. But Madara brings this, this craziness, this zaniness to the characters. I mean, look at this guy with his neon presentation, the giant hammers, the angel, the, the, well, I mean, she needs some more clothes, to be honest, but many of the characters, the presentation here had this weird, I don't know, modern day, uh, modern day, I, I don't even know the style, or whatever it's called, but it was unique in this presentation, the characters felt different, the story felt different, and the reviews for this are off the charts, people love this game. And so despite myself, I found myself more intrigued in this than I did in Gloomhaven. You know, I've talked about this in videos before, but people constantly say they don't want the same old tropes in their games. They want something new. They don't want the same old zombies and dungeon crawler. They want something different. And yet zombies and dungeon crawlers are what sell. And so I do like it when a game actually does deliver something that's different, but that still manages to appeal to me at the same time. Wonderland's War is a game that I backed half because of the theme. It was being something different to my collection, something unique. And that's not always going to be the case. The other times, something unique means it's not going to be for me. There's a benefit to just catering to everybody. You lack origination. You lack imagination. But at least you're interesting. 
to many people. And Madara is interesting to me, despite being very, very different in his presentation. And so I'm excited for it. I think this might be the game. This is one of the many reasons why I think Gloomhaven might stay. But keep in mind, at the same time, even while I tell you all the reasons I'm interested in it, it's still a giant box full of a ton of stuff that I may or may not end up keeping. And moving on. Speaking of giant boxes that I may or may not end up keeping, we have Oathsworn. Now, Oathsworn, I've had the opportunity to play since then. Can you late pledge this thing? I don't think you can play. I believe they will have another campaign eventually. The first campaign did well enough. This is one that I had the opportunity to play on TTS uh, maybe a month or two ago. I don't know exactly when. Well after I backed it, and I did go all in on this game. And it was, it's one of those things. It's the same exact problem we just saw. On the one hand, I liked what I played. On the other hand... They're talking about how it's like three Kallax cubes full of boxes in order to get this game, the all-in pledge. Now, if I can condense it down, it's a different story. If I can't, it's a different story. Because the games still need to be accessible. I still need to be able to pull it out and play it without looking at whatever behind me on the shelf, wondering how I'm actually going to get to the table. Time of Legends, Joan of Arc had this problem and still does. It's one of the reasons I got rid of it. When a game takes up multiple Kallax cubes, I need to be able to pull out content from one of those Kallax cubes in order to play it. And if I can't, you're likely going to leave. And so Oathsworn was very well done. I really like the combat system. I really like the boss AI. It seemed to be a combination of, of aspects of Gloomhaven and aspects of Kingdom Death Monster. I have not played Kingdom Death Monster. Keep that in mind. It gave you a lot of interesting choices and decisions and tons of characters that I wanted to experience. When I got onto TTS and got to experience the game, there had these host of characters, all with their own unique abilities and decks and ways that they play, and each one was intriguing, and each one presented a promise of how I would experience the game differently, and then each monster and boss you fight against is this whole different story, and I didn't even experience any of the story or the, the way you explore and go through the adventure, and all of it, all of it seems intriguing to me. Again, the biggest flag against this is that it's three giant boxes, and so I'm intrigued how that goes. Like, sometimes I'm excited about the next Kickstarter, this time I'm terrified. I'm terrified of whatever's going to show up in another Kickstarter if they put more content out because three giant boxes is... It's a conversation I don't want to have. But I'm excited about this one. We'll see how it ends up doing. Which brings us to 7th Citadel. 7th Citadel is the game that I backed and got rid of 7th Continent because of it. Now, 7th Citadel still has many of the same problems 7th Continent does. You're still playing a bit of a filing system, constantly riffling through the deck, pulling out the card, and then when you're done, when it's time for cleanup, you have to sit there and go through a stack of like 40, 50 cards and go... Just constantly refiling all the games. Now, I recommend throwing on a video in the background so you can double up on your time when you're putting it away. But man, this game is so good, even while the cleanup and the filing system is so tedious. Now, 7th Citadel, on the one hand... It took away from the simplicity of Seventh Continent. If I were recommending a game system to somebody and asking, and they were asking me what to back for the first time, I'd say try Seventh Continent first. I think it's a cleaner system, but I think Seventh Citadel is a better system. Seventh Citadel improved on a lot of things that I liked about the game. To begin with, I much preferred the experience of running through this Citadel over here, this journey. It actually felt like I was going through a story, like I was a character with invested in what's going on. In Seventh Continent, I didn't feel invested. I felt like I was walking around an island and just kind of doing things. Now, granted, they ultimately ended up being the same thing, but in Seventh Citadel, you ran through hallways. You made decisions. You, you chose to execute or not execute a prisoner or how you dealt with somebody. And then you had ramifications of decisions. You start off the game. That first intro scenario, you start off the game with the choice as to whether you're going to drag a wounded survivor through, that, through the hallways with you or leave them behind. I left them behind, by the way. It seems to be taking way too much strength to deal with them. But that has ramifications. It has ramifications as to who comes back to your colony, how they will interplay with the game down the road. It seemed to be providing both an immersive storytelling adventure as well as the legacy aspect of consequences. It was giving me the, the, the journey of Seventh Continent, a few things I found more fiddly. I didn't like the new combat system. But overall, Seventh Citadel is one that, this is where we start getting into the category. I think Seventh Citadel and onwards is where we start getting into the category of the ones that I really think have a much higher chance of staying in my collection. I don't know if I'll pull it out as often as I want to, but I think I will pull it out because it is so good at what it does. And moving on from there, we have Storm Sunder, Hairs of Rune. And, and perhaps I should move this a step back. You see, Storm Sunder was a game that for a long time, I thought I would get it, try it, and ultimately it'd be in the same place as Madara, as Oats 1, as Gloomhaven. It's too much game for what I'm looking for. And yet, I recently had the opportunity to play Wild Descent, and I'm loving Wild Descent. And Storm Sunder, from speaking to the developer, Storm Sunder is seems to be the, the upgraded Big Brother version of Wild Descent. Now, that doesn't mean Wild Descent is bad. Keep in mind, I love Wild Descent, and I haven't played Storm Sunder, so maybe maybe the changes they make are not what I'm looking for. 
But if it's giving me a wild ascent based system with tweaks, adjustments, and changes, it means it's operating off a core that I already know that I enjoy. And so Storm Thunder went from being a game that I was like, I'll back it, but maybe I'll just sell it if it's not for me, to a game that I'm thoroughly looking forward to. Completely terrified of all the content they have. This is going to be a recurring theme in all these things. There's a reason that I'm doing this video. There's too much game out there. Too many games, too much game of individual systems. But I'm interested in Storm Thunder far more than I was before. Some of the most gorgeous miniatures I've seen in any game system. And a story that may or may not pull me in. I don't know. I'm not generally as story-driven as other people. Again, I know I like Isis Vanguard, but it, it has to be a story that really pulls me in. I'm not looking to be pulled in. You have to pull me in despite myself. But these characters, the card play, the powers, the abilities, all these things in this system just look like a game system that I want to enjoy. And now that I've played Wild Ascent and have enjoyed it, I'm looking forward to Storm Thunder that much more. This is the part of the video where I apologize to you in advance and let you know that you could late pledge this one it might be the only one you can i don't actually know which ones you can late pledge because most of these are already closer to arriving or on the way i've stopped backing or slowed down on backing these epic systems but storm thunder you still could late pledge it probably won't be here anytime soon but that means i can get rid of some of these other games or play through them as, as time goes on and from there we go to its nearest adventure arena the contest which i think you actually could late pledge for this one as well now this one i heavily debated not including because this one, more so than many of the rest, you genuinely can one-shot it. I have one-shot it. The only ways I've actually played this game are one-shotting it. But at the same time, especially this one, especially the adventures of the Terrace Adventures as opposed to Arena of the Contest, seems to be giving you a ton of campaign content for a game that I, I've played it, like, I don't know, five, six times. It's, it's in my top, like, 20 games of all time, but I've only played it five or six times. This is a solid, solid game that I really enjoy. And yet I don't pull it out often enough. Now, part of that, part of that's because... Once I knew I had upgraded miniatures, upgraded everything coming, it's a little bit harder to pull out the old stuff. I sit there and look at my shelves and I'm like, I'll play something else and I'll play Arena when I get the new stuff, the new content, the new miniatures. But part of it's just that some of these games are hard to pull out. Now this one I don't think will go anywhere. I don't know if I'll enjoy the campaign content ever. I don't know if I'll really be able to fully dive into it ever. I might, I might not. But the fact that I could one-shot this, the fact that I could have singular experiences that are fun, rewarding means I'm a little bit more likely to just pull it out that way, to refresh myself here and there on the systems, the interplay of the powers, the abilities, the going through the cooperative system, or or perhaps going through the competitive system. I haven't actually played the competitive system of this, but I'm, I'm down for trying it at some point, especially now that I've played Bloodstone and like the head-to-head. -head. I'm curious whether this will give me another game system that I enjoy head-to-head. -head. But I always got it for the co-op, and I've always enjoyed it for the co-op and solo play. And so Arena of the Contest is not going anywhere. I can tell you that with confidence. It's been there for a while, and it's not going anywhere. Whether or not I ever get the campaign stuff to the table is a different conversation, though. Which brings us to the rule of the smog, Rise of Moloch. And this is one this is one that's also not going anywhere because my wife would probably murder me. Rena would probably murder me if I got rid of this one. This is going to be a, a game that we don't play enough. It's the rule of the smog. It's a campaign-based system. You have to play a minimum of six games and likely more. If you're trying to interplay all the expansion, all the Kickstarter content, then generally you're playing roughly nine games at a time. That's a lot of games to sign up for, especially when you're playing with another person back and forth. It's one that Rena and I have only gone through, like, we've only gone through a full campaign, I think, twice. And yet we need to do it again. This is one, this is another one we should probably do some both channel content and Patreon content for. But it's one that, yeah, I get, I, I honestly, now I'm excited for it. I actually want to do that. I want to go through a full campaign uh, as a film content for whatever it is, can justify it a little more. But it's a solid game system. We really like it. It's one of those hidden gems. Everyone who plays this, well, not everyone, it's well rated on Board Game Geek. It's like an 8.1, 8.2, something like that. People seem to like this game. I like this game a lot. We like this game. We love the characters and all that. It is a lot of fun to play. But it's also signing up for six to nine missions at a time, which is a whole different conversation. And it involves a lot decent amount of setup of getting it to the table. So it's one that we'll continue to play. It's definitely not going anywhere. I can tell you that with confidence. But even while it doesn't go anywhere, it may not be played as often as I'd like to. And, and in terms of context, I often compare this one to Star Wars Imperial Assault. It shares a lot of the same high notes of the game. We actually got both at the same time. We dove into both, and we chose this one. We thought this one had a lot more character, a lot more interesting stuff going on in the game than, than Star Wars Imperial Assault. Although, granted, people love Star Wars Imperial Assault, so take that with a grain of salt. Two left. And this one's going to be Wild Ascent. Wild Ascent, which I've just been enjoying. This is one that I started playing it. I wasn't sure if I'd keep it. Like I said already, that high of waiting two years for a game eventually does start to wear off. But this one, despite that, despite that that delay, we got I got it. I played it, and I've been continuing to play it. I'm like eight missions in at this point. Eight, uh, eight missions of a ten-mission campaign. And I'm pretty sure I'm going to finish it 
and then within a month or two, I'll be diving straight back into it. The amount of characters you have, the amount of monsters you have, the amount of expansion content you can mix in, the ways you can play this game. I'm currently playing the default vanilla campaign, which means no official flavor text or story around it. When I jump in again, I'll probably jump into the actual campaign with a story and progression and set characters and pathways and maps and all of that. Overall, this game is one that has really delivered for me. It's light. Keep that in mind. I recently had the opportunity to play it with someone else who has, is a Kingdom Death Bouncer fan and, well, Quacklope, and they were, you know, intrigued by it but not sold. And, and I think that's because they're coming to, for, first of all, they played one game. And my, my experience, my progression experience went up game after game after game. But they played one game and they're like, you know what? It's interesting, but it's a little light. And I, I agree. It is a little light. And that's what I'm personally looking for in this type of game. I'm not looking for stat sheets and intricacies and back and forth. I'm not looking for a set of, of a, a full-on developed game system for me to experience. I'm looking for something I can dive into and play and enjoy. And this one I can. I knock out games of this in 45 minutes to an hour, and then I play through the encampment phase in 15, 20 minutes, and I'm getting a full game experience in an hour and a half. This whole game campaign, this whole 10 game campaign, is 10 to 15, maybe 20 hours of content. I can justify doing that a few times a year for a game that I really like, and make no mistake, I do really like Wild Ascent. This is one that's staying for now, and I'm looking forward to the fact they actually announced this already over here. If you look at the updates, the most recent update, which granted will annoy some people because they don't have their game yet. Hey, look, that's me over there is going to be the fact that they're looking into having another, you know, another follow-up to this campaign. Wild Ascent expansion content or whatnot. With more miniatures, more beasts, more stuff. I don't know what, what it's going to entail, but I'm happy to have more content for this game. I want more workers, more equipment, more gear, more different things. As much as, as, much as there's already a lot, I definitely want more. And I want an insert. I need an insert for this. I've sleeved my cards. I have, I have real problems here with this game. With the rulebook, the rulebook is not the worst, but it doesn't cover a million FAQs. And I need a better insert system because I've sleeved my cards and I have no way to easily and comprehensively pull this out. I'll be ditching all my foam very shortly, getting rid of entirely, and figuring out how I'm going to actually store and deal with this. Probably just one box for the miniatures and one box for all the other content. I'll figure it out, but right now it's, it's not ideal. And that's Wild Ascent. One more left. And I'm curious if you know what it is, because I've talked about it, and I like it, and I'm very much looking forward to it, and it's not going anywhere. And that's going to be Primal. Primal The Awakening is a game that, it's very close to Wild Ascent for me, very close. But I prefer it to, I prefer Primal to Wild Ascent, at least I'm pretty sure I do. The gameplay here is more Marvel Champions in the card play you have going on. You have multiple characters fighting off a singular monster on a board that's barely a board. You're rotating around in a circle, but it actually does matter. The facing, the direction, each beast and creature you fight against has different inter has different ways that they they feel, that they, that they play with. And you're going to level up across 10 to 14 missions. I think it's actually 14. I can't remember the exact amount. I think it's between 10 and 15 missions. Whatever it is, you're going to go through, because you have a few losses before you actually officially lose, but then you also have a number, set number of wins. And so you're going to go through each of these experiences, and again, it's going to be somewhere in the range of 15, 20 hours of content for that campaign, which is manageable enough that I'm still intrigued and not yet pushed off, and I like the gameplay enough that I will jump into it. It falls into the same style as Wild Ascent for me. It's a game that I would play at one and two players. I'd be hesitant to play it at three and four. It's a game I'm happy to play at solo. It's a game that's going to be roughly 20 hours of content and campaign. It's a game that that gives you each experience in roughly an hour, hour and a half. It's a game where the creatures you're fighting against are going to totally change up the experience. It's a game where, well, they don't have the sheer degree of variability in the, the heroes you have. But overall, this game, Primal, is so much fun. While Wild Ascent is, is lighter in its tactical maneuvering, it's more about the upgrading and the encampment phase game to game. And keep in mind, I haven't fully experienced the tactical upgrading between games of Primal. I have not been able to experience the campaign because they haven't given me the campaign. I experienced two different games, one with regular base game content. Well, I played it like four or five times, but I experienced the basic intro scenario and I experienced the upgraded content of, look, here's a scenario where you have extra gear, extra weapons as if you've upgraded. Another one shot, but a one shot at a different point in your experience. And it was totally different. The idea of going through this game and upgrading my character, upgrading my deck, buying different gear, different stats, different things that will develop how I fight against the monster is going to give me all the things I already like about Primal and then all the other things I like about Wild Ascent 2. I am so ridiculously excited for this game. And that's basically it. 24 games. 24 campaign experiences. Games with a lot of content around them. They're not all going to stay. That's inherent. Again, the first four or five are just going to eventually go away as I play them enough to feel like I've checked that box and move on. And then from there, it's a question of which ones really deliver. I mean, we have Madara, Gloomhaven, Oathsworn, do we just don't have time for that. 
Although, again, it's something I'm working on, something I want to do as this channel grows, as as this eventually becomes a full-time thing, the idea of doing a full separate channel, or maybe just, I don't know, I'll figure out how I do it, but the idea of doing dedicated content to cover and go through these campaigns to fully dive into them is something I can actually dream about or think about if or when this becomes a full-time thing. But for right now, it's, you know, back burner kind of situation. The problem, the problem is we're not locked into a static moment in time. We're not locked into a singular moment where I can say, these are the 24 games and I'll put them on my shelf and I'll figure it out. There's going to be another game and another game and another game. It's going to keep continuing. More content for games we love, more new games that we might potentially love. It's a constant, it's a busy world out there. And I haven't even covered them all. There's so many that I haven't actually backed or played or engaged with. We're very fortunate. We're very uh, blessed to be in this board game renaissance of just too many board games. And it's a, uh, I'm along for the ride. I have no regrets or minimal regrets about these games. I'll experience them. I'll try them. I'll see if they're for me. And then ultimately at the end of the day, I will keep the ones that resonate with me the most. The same way you should keep the ones that resonate with you the most. And odds are, they won't be the exact same game. That's the fun part of this experience. The ones, the Gloomhavens that other people are going through all hundred games, whatever it is, and loving it. They might be the people who play Primal and be like, this is a terrible game. Different strokes for different folks. Anyways, that was my dive down way too many stuff. I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. And as always, I hope you have a good one.